All right, when other people are sitting, I don't like standing. <laughs> so to be in unity with you, in practice, I'm going to sit. So I hope uh, people don't mind that. Again, uh, my name is Kali Akuno uh, with Cooperation Jackson, based in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I'm also with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, uh, which is a national organization, an organization of people of African descent, uh, and has about 10 chapters spread throughout the country. And I'm bringing both of these up because Cooperation Jackson, number one, uh, in many respects is a child of that organization. Um, but it also, I think, gives a, a kind of a, a, a range of the broad the broad base of which I want to kind of center some of my comments in, at, at least from the beginning. And then get to uh, some more specifics around Jackson, because I believe, you know, in our practice, we have to be rooted somewhere firmly on the ground uh, in order to, to have a basis on which to stand for and some practice that you can point to uh, as illustrative of what you're, you know, struggling for, what you're trying to articulate. So I'm trying to straddle between the two. Now, why? I'm going to make an argument that, uh, and this is making an assumption about everybody in the room, but I, I'm, I'm making a safe assumption that most folks would consider themselves on the left here. Um, but I would argue that in many respects, uh, our side of the present equation, uh, you know, our action and our practice do not equate to our ideas, our theories and our principles. And if we have to make, you know, some balance, some unity between the two very, very quickly. And not necessarily just because number 45 is in office. In many <laughs> respects, I think that's, that's a symptom of uh, a deeper crisis that we have to figure out we got to deal with. It. So let me, let me do kind of like a call and response and, and see, hopefully this illustrate what I mean. So how many people think that 63, 63 degree weather in Madison in February is normal? Yeah. <laughs> I see one hand that says, this is normal? Not normal. Okay, not normal at all. How many people here think 63 degree weather in Madison in February is dangerous? Okay. So let me ask, in some respects, the same question another way. How many people here think that there's still room for reform on the capitalism? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to build some consensus here, so speak up. It, it, we don't think it, it's, it's that reformable, for the most part. No. Do we have a program that speaks to this principle? Do we have a program that speaks to, to this perspective that we hold? We have too many programs. <laughs> I think I unite with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> But the central point that folks who couldn't hear in the back said there are too many programs. We have too many programs. We have too many sectarian, small yeah. little sects of 25 and 30 and maybe a couple of hundred people running around uh, thinking we're going to, you know, with that two or three hundred people uh, unite in uh, 200 plus million uh, without a really a broad base of mass based practice, right? Uh, so, theory divorced from all reality. But I'm raising this point because I think there's more broad consensus, but we don't have the program, or we haven't developed the program, or we haven't struggled enough with each other, I think, to develop this program. And I think the situation now, you know, points in, in the direction that if we don't get our act together real quick, 45 will be the least of our concerns, right? <laughs> the least of our concern. Because what's happening right now with this, you know, freakish weather, and I like it hot, so it's yeah. good for me to be <laughs> in, 
you know, this is kind of cold for Mississippi, to be honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still. But it ain't normal, right? It's not how the earth regulates or has been regulating itself, at least for the past couple of thousand years, to where other complex life can understand the rhythms and flows and move and act accordingly, right? I know in some of our areas, you know, the plants are blooming too soon. And what does that mean? The birds and the bugs are not, you know, doing their normal cycle at the right time, so they're, they're totally off, right? You know, the bugs are coming out too early, and the birds are having, in, in, uh, laying their eggs too late, you know, which is pointing both towards imbalance. And you start showing up real early in, in the birds, you know, beginning, getting to their reproductive cycles going down, leading towards extinction. And we don't yet fully grasp that how we're dependent on all of those birds and all of those bugs and all the little things that are in the ground for our own existence, right? We think we're a little bit smarter than what we really are, and we have a deeper <laughs> grasp on how this earth works than what we really do, and we think we can, can keep abusing it in particular ways and it's not going to hurt us so that we'll be smart enough to come up with some techno fix or you know some new gadget or some new trick that's going to get us out of a serious bind. Don't work that way. Don't work that way. So we we are arguing that we have to come up with a serious, our side of the equation has to come up with a serious program and, and engage in some serious dialogue in the here and now. And I'm challenging all of us to engage in that. Uh, you know, I'm not going to put a time limit on it, but we need to engage in that as much as we are out in the streets fighting against what 45 and all these reactionary, you know, conservatives are doing. So I want you to hold on to that. Because we can do, and we should do, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be out there fighting against every single thing that they do, we should. But the reality is we don't have the capacity to fight them right now on every single thing that they do. And we got to be real about that. And deal with the sad consequences of it too. Right? Uh, and that, what I mean by that is there are some losses that we are going to take in this next period. I, I don't like saying that, but I'm just trying to be honest and truthful in saying that there are some losses that we're going to take in this next period. And to get ourselves mentally prepared for that and do the organizing that is necessary so that we have backup plans to withstand the first level, the first round of assaults against what little democracy has ever existed in this country that they're trying to eliminate it even further and take us back to the 16th century. Because that's what their program is. I mean, they're, 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 don't be confused about what they're really trying to do. You know, part of it is about, you know, returning the rate of profit. That's, a, you know, we, we're not denying it. I wouldn't deny it at all. But they want to do it in such a manner that, you know, those who are supposed to be, you know, in their right respective places go back in their places. Mm -hmm. And that's virtually everybody. Right? Yep. Once you really think about it, being white is not going to necessarily protect you from that you know, illogic. Because women will go back in the home if they have to, anything to say about it, go back to domestic duties, right? And on down the list. So we have to, you know, really, I think, develop a serious program and that starts with dialogue uh, amongst us. And there's a couple of things, you know, one of the things that we've been, myself, have really been promoting on, on a national level is a framework, I want to call it that more so than anything, this framework of ungovernability. And what that's fundamentally about is we are, do not give any legitimacy to number 45 and, more importantly, to what at least we are calling the neo-confederates, who I would argue are actually far more dangerous and have a far more dangerous program uh, than what Trump is really trying to do. Because I would argue in many respects what Trump is really there to do is to renegotiate the terms of empire. Mm -hmm. And distract. And distract. But that's fundamentally what his job is. And I think he's going to do an excellent job at it. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, not everybody's going to, within their first month in office, go to Europe or send a team to Europe and say, hey, we're going to renegotiate NATO. We're going to re renegotiate our relationship with the EU. We're paying too much. We don't want to pay anymore. Right, they're renegotiating the terms of empire. That's a critical piece of what this whole trip is about. And regardless of who was going to be there, if Hillary would have won, she would have had to do some of the fundamental things. Because the world has changed. 
America is not the top dog like it used to be 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Right? And then some, sometimes only the people in the United States don't quite get, grasp that reality. You know, but it ain't the same world that it used to be. Now, he's still under some notion that, you know, he's like John Wayne and he can just, you know, pull out a pistol and everybody's going to duck and run for cover. Yeah, he's going to do it with you know. his hat. He's going to do it with his hat. With his hat? Yeah. Well, it's better than that yellow hair, but, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, China's not going to blink in the same way it once did. Russia's not going to blink in the same way it once did. The terms are different. The economy is different. The structure of the world is profoundly different. And so they got to renegotiate some terms, and it's going to be different. I mean, it probably, in some respects, I would argue, this is a, a deeper conversation, is that there's, I don't want to call it a passing of the torch, because uh, I don't believe fundamentally in, in hedge-minded forces, but I think that is in part what is, what is playing itself out. And that's dangerous, because the last two times this happened in the capitalist world system, it's always led to profound war wars and profound disruptions that are only mediated through war and the process of creative destruction. And I, I'm kind of like Einstein, that you know we don't quite quite sure know how World War III would play out, but we know the result of World War IV. Folks yeah. would be back to sticks and stones, right? Uh, uh, let these mad men kind of have their way with the tools and toys that they have, which they possess. So I like to avoid that. I like to avert that. Uh, is as much possible, and I hope most of you want to do that as well. But that means we got to get ourselves profoundly more organized than what we are now. And we are not an organized force. Let's not kid ourselves. With the unions, with our political parties, we're not as organized as, even as much as we once were 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, does it mean that we don't know how to do that? Not in a whole. I think we do still know a lot of those tried and true techniques. And when I mean by organized, I'm not talking about creating a great internet platform. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. That's a, that'll help us do some things, right? Uh, it'll help us do some things faster, right? But we need to be organized on the level to, to, to where if Dario gives me a call to engage in an action, I can say with certainty how many people I can get to commit to doing that action, right? With, yeah. Without a moment's hesitation. That's organized. That's organized. Hey, okay, you know, you call me, give me two days, I can move 50 people, put them in action. And we can agree on, you know, if it's a political action, you know, if there's a demonstration or for some other action, whatever it may be, but making sure that I'm in contact with that many people who are ready to act and are trained enough to act on the ground in my community. That's the level of organizing I'm talking about that I think we have to get to. We've done it once before, you know, in all of our societies we've done it once before, and we can do it again. It's, it's hard work, it's not magic, it's just a bunch of hard work, dialoguing, you know, dealing with each other's contradictions, dealing with each other's shortcomings, dealing with each other's failings. That's ultimately what we're gonna have to, to do in the future. Um, the other piece that I think we have to do uh, with this, we have to make a serious, we have to engage in a serious struggle uh, around the means of production, and particularly around some of the new means of production that are emerging and developing rather quickly. Uh, and to a degree, we've always been engaged in it, so I'm not necessarily proposing anything new. But I think there's a difference between arguing for a job and fighting to control your, the economy. Those are two different things. And I think that for, for many of us, particularly the most vulnerable amongst us, capitalism has already emerged and developed to a point where there are profound surplus populations all over the globe. Right? And I think now it's starting trying to develop the political will to get rid of some of those surpluses. Yep. Yep. That's also, I think, what part of what 45 is about. Like, you know, can we put somebody in place who has the political will, the political nerve and gumption to just eliminate whole sectors of humanity? Mm -hmm. yep. And we should not be surprised that it's on the table. The system has done it before. 
and left unchecked, it will do it again. Right? It will do it again. So we shouldn't shy away from that. I think you know, act like it's not there. Because from what I see a lot of times, there's a constant kind of acting like, I can't believe they did that, or I can't believe that this is happening. I can't believe that it speaks to a, a profound disconnect as to that's been happening to indigenous people all along, that's been happening to black people all along. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, I'm glad you woke it up. You know. <laughs> Uh, but understand that it can get worse, right? Uh, it can get worse, and we have to get prepared for that. And so arguing, and I think struggling for that, I think is the key thing. And I want to argue that I don't think that we do enough throughout this country to have a serious conversation between what is left of organized labor, and I'm saying that intentionally, right, and what is emerging as the cooperative field in this country. We aren't in deep enough dialogue and conversation with each other about how, as workers, and we're all workers, how as workers we're going to shape our own future. And I'm saying that because part of a, a big part of what cooperation Jackson is based upon is a black reality that ain't nobody creating no jobs for us. That day is long since past. And where I'm at in Jackson, Mississippi, the real unemployment rate easily is over 50%. I can knock on uh, almost any door in a black working class community any day of the week, and there is an able-bodied adult typically who will answer the door any time of day to just give you a real sense of what I mean by deep level unemployment. Right? Now that is a challenge in terms of income, but that's also a great organizing opportunity. Right? So I think we gotta look at it, and that's what we've been trying to do. Let's put that on his head. Flip it. Right? You have some time and energy. Can we utilize that to do something collective in our, in our community? Can we bring your skills, time, energy, resources, and talents together with other folks under similar circumstances as you and transform our reality. Now it takes a lot of convincing of people. Folks just ain't gonna come out their house and you know, just because you show up with a great idea and automatically jump on it. It don't work that way in Jackson, it don't work that way anywhere I've ever lived. But we are starting to see some results in having and taking that approach. Right? And getting people to just start doing small things, you know, that's help pull together some time and energy to fix the cars and, and bikes and stuff in the neighborhood to do with the transportation crisis that we have in our, in our city. Jackson is a city, there's a few public buses, but we don't really have a public transportation system, to be honest with you. Right, so if you don't have a car, you are pretty much kind of ass out in terms of, you know, trying to get a job or going to a grocery store or, and there are a lot of people in that situation. But that's an opportunity also for us from an organizer's perspective. Because it helps us to kind of put people in a relationship, right? I have a car, I have some time, you know how to fix a car, you have some time. Let's work together and we can work creating out of a mutual system. And now one of the next steps that, that we are working on actually you know, uh, with Rebecca is how do we create our own kind of cab, you know, company, right? Cooperative cab company. And for us, it's like looking at it on a deeper level, how is it fulfilling a, 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 a social need, not just a transportation, but a social need in our community, right? So some deeper things that I think we have to look at a lot of these challenges is, you know, from, from the space of our own autonomy, from the space of our own agency, how can we turn all of these particular crises on the head and turn them into opportunities? Right? And so part of it is the challenge of how we are looking you know, at the new world. And rather than see some of the limitations, see that there's, there's more space from the decay of late capitalism to actually do some things to push back and, and, and make their case to start seizing the means of production, first building them up, but also gradually taking them over and assuming them. That is a big part of our project in, in, in Jackson, right? Um, 
and what we've been fighting for, you know, with, with the Jackson Cush plant. Now that's nothing that ever stays static or, 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 you know, stays in one place. So things have profoundly changed in Jackson since 2014 when the Chokelet passed. Uh, we have put his son up to run for mayor. He's running for mayor now. Uh, the first round of elections are May 2nd. By all indications, uh, as of right now, uh, we're well ahead in the lead. Uh, I don't expect us to lose, but I expect far more challenges for us under this term than, his, than what his father faced. The city is under profound debt. We are uh, being faced with the threat of losing uh, control over our water system. Uh, our public education system is going to be seized uh, this summer by the state uh, through primarily the orchestration of, uh, you know, state-mandated uh, testing and they change the goalposts every year to produce the, the outcome that they wanted. Uh, after three years of successive uh, Fs, when they change the test every single year, and the teachers uh, have to teach to the test, right? And if you change the test on the teachers, you know, that means the students are not getting a part of what they need. But this is the game that they played. Uh, 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 but since it was statewide, uh, we couldn't quite pull together the coalition to stop it. But that's one thing, a new term that we have. And then our governor uh, is very, very close to Trump. We exist in uh, uh, the Tea Party basically runs our state. Our governor is a member of the Tea Party. There's a Tea Party supermajority uh, in the legislature in both houses, uh, and also within the state court system. So we've been living under a kind of this one party rule that now everybody's experiencing for, for six years. So we've learned a few lessons that perhaps we can impart. Um, same, similar here now, too. Right? For six years. I thought there was a Democratic legislator until about two years ago here in Georgia. No, no. <laughs> no. Not a majority. Not no. a majority. No. Well, similar. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that this is is um, our reality, you know, kind of what we're dealing with. And because of how close our governor is uh, to, to Trump, Trump has given him certain promises that he can do some things that the Army Corps of Engineers has been telling the state of Mississippi that have been impossible for almost 25 years. And so he's been bragging and boasting since the inauguration that uh, they're going to create a whole new water system for uh, Rankin County, uh, which is a predominantly white working class uh, county, the home of the claim uh, in, in, in Mississippi, that's right next to, right next door uh, to Jackson. Um, and the, the county only has 40,000 people, uh, but they're going to build them a whole new water system, right, uh, where they don't even have the density to pay for the water bill for the system that they're going to create. But it, the, the point is, it's more political, because Jackson uh, receives 42% of its annual revenue from the sale of water to the greater metro area. So if you take water away from us, basically you destroy the ability of the municipality to, to in effect, function. So it's a deep-seated political reason. It has nothing to do with providing a service. It's just how do you break the back of a political unit that you don't want having or exercising power, right? So that's a particular piece of what they're planning on doing, um, in, in our case, is annexing a critical part of the, 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 what they call the downtown area, where 60% of the jobs in, in the city of Jackson are located in this new district that they're creating, and turn that over to the government. And then they want to create, in addition to this, this additional water system, they want to flood a good portion of downtown Jackson to create a lake and a casino uh, district. Uh, the deeper point of this, and then I'm gonna switch, you know, the deeper point of this, these are all symptoms, symptoms of, a, of, a, of a, just little pieces of a plan. The long-term objective is to break the political back of Jackson. Jackson is 85% black, 85% black. And by their calculation, they can take Jackson back politically if they're able to reduce Jackson's current black population down to 65 to 60%. 
then that gives them enough, you know, uh, uh, power and force demographically to be able to split the black vote yeah. and then get whatever candidate that, that they want in. So this is all part of a long-term coordinated plan and strategy, the level at which they are dialoguing and, and coordinating and working with each other. I'm citing all this to give you an example of what organization looks like <laughs> and what we need to do to get to that level of also sophisticated coordination, strategy, development, organizing. Their side can do it, our side can do it. We just have to break certain habits and certain perspectives which keep us from dialoguing with each other, keep us from seriously struggling with each other, and keep us from, from working with each other in coordinated ways, even when we disagree. That is a critical weakness that we have, right? That we have to figure out how to, to overcome and we better do so quickly. And the last thing I do want to say that we've been, we've been pushing, I'm just offering this in part uh, as, a, as an honest, from my perspective, warning. You know, the Democratic Party, as it's presently constructed, and I don't believe it can be reformed. We make that clear, personally. Um, but it's not going to save us, y'all. This, this group, if you're expecting it to save you from 45, if you're expecting it to save you from Scott Walker's, it's not going to happen. We got to organize something different. And it may, you know, take some remnants of that old structure with it. But we got to organize something different, something new that's going to reach the vast majority of those who are oppressed, exploited, and excluded in this society. And it's something that can be done. I don't think it's going to take a lot of hard work. Let's not elude ourselves that it's not. But we have to remember all of what these, these Tea Party, Republican folks, 45, they can only represent a minority from this point forward. That is all they can represent. Now they can rule effectively as a minority. Let's not be confused ourselves or lose ourselves that they can't. You know, we need to look at South Africa and understand how a minority can effectively rule an overwhelming majority. But we have to recognize that there, if we look in a different way and organize in a different way, there's a profound new majority which is black, brown, and everything else in between that we can tap into, have to tap into, that I think is, is more than willing and willing to politically be politically engaged. They just don't see the electoral form as the only viable form of doing it, or as the most expedient in doing it to deal with their real life situation and circumstances. So we have to think outside of the box, those upon the left, instead of just trying to channel most of our energy into the electoral fights, what are the other things that we have to build on the side that parallel this, that are actually building power in our communities and organizing people to exercise that power? People's Assemblies is one, cooperatives or another, but those are not the only form. Those are just two particular types of tools that we've been trying to work on develop, but those, those, that's not it. But I would argue again, going that back to that same point, we have to give as much time to the build as we're doing to the to the fight, and we have to give equal time to actually sitting down in our communities, having meetings with our neighbors, whether they agree or disagree with us, right, and, and constructing a real political and viable program going forward. If we don't, again, 45 is going to be the least of our concerns the least of our concerns. So I'll, I'll end it there. I do believe, I'm one who, uh, I think this is a hell of a time. Uh, I think we should in, embrace the fluidity of the time and not be afraid of it. Uh, for any of you, you know, out there like me who, who you know, consider yourself a socialist, um, I, would not have believed I could actually even say that in many places publicly two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but that space is now open and is one that we need to seize uh, and not let that moment pass or fade because there's millions of people out there looking for alternatives and are hungry for 
And if we're silent, we're not engaged, we're not, in, you know, really pressing forward the dialogue, we're missing a critical moment. This is a very fluid moment. It may look bleak from how the structure is set up. But again, they're a minority. They don't have much room or vulnerability. At the end, they, they have a few economic things and levers that they can pull, which are very serious and shouldn't be underestimated. But, you know, we know that they're going to have to resort to force in order to keep this thing together. And that's a losing combination at the end of the day. So let us seize the time and opportunity. Don't be weary. You know, there's plenty of people out there to talk to who want to be organized. Get to work.